All right, this is part three of my video series looking at Carl Bau's creation in the 21st century. Uh, the specific episode I'm looking at here is called Preponderance of Evidence and stars Dr. John Hefner. Uh, so I'll just get started. Now, another piece of evidence that I'd like for the jury to consider is from the field of animal husbandry or animal science. All right. And in the 2006 National Academy of Sciences uh, Proceedings has released uh, an interesting statement. They say that several years' worth of research on mitochondrial DNA in goats and sheep show that all goats living today are from five ancient females. Well... Well, okay. And they said uh, all sheep living today are from four or five, approximately the same number of ancient females. Now, is this important? Hey, kids, with a little profound ignorance and some mythology, you too can ruin perfectly good science. Uh, this this segment here, I went back and watched it several times because I was not quite believing. Maybe I thought, maybe I'm making a mistake. Maybe I'm not understanding what he's trying to say here. And, uh, well, he, he, he was saying what I thought he was saying, which makes absolutely no sense given the papers that he presents, the papers on mitochondrial analysis of sheep and goats. So... So this, what does this mean? What what does this data mean? Did did scientists actually prove that you know sometime around you know three thousand five hundred years ago there was this little herd of sheep and this little herd of goats that subsequently gave rise to all modern goats and sheep? Is that what is that what this paper showed? Is that what these scientists proved? Um, well, it turns out no. No, they didn't. Uh, luckily, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences is available. Almost every, all of it is available online. Uh, you can search their archives. I'll put a link down. Uh, you can check it out yourself. Uh, so what, what were these papers about? Well, I don't have access to the sheep article, unfortunately. Uh, I do have article, access to both of the articles on goats and mitochondrial DNA. Um, uh, they're both really good papers. Uh, I'll, I'll, again, they're, they're, worth checking out. But what do these papers say? Well, it turns out that, yes, indeed, goats go, goats are all the descendants, all modern goats are the descendants of five haplotypes. What are those haplotypes? What are mitochondrial haplotypes? What does that mean? Well, it means five independent domestication events. Okay? Um, now, sort of, if I can... I'm going to rant a little bit here, ramble a little bit here. Hopefully, it'll make some sense. So, imagine yourself you know, living 5,000 years ago, I don't know. And you and your group go out and you find some wild, I don't know what it, a wild oryx or something, I don't know. And you catch a bunch of them. Rather than killing them, you catch a bunch of them. Say you maybe you hunt some and take their babies back to your camp. And you raise them. And you let them have babies. Okay? You've started the domestication process. Now, a thousand years later, or five thousand years later, or whenever, some future archaeologist is now studying these domestic versions of, of what you got, they can trace back to that individual to that individual's haplotype that you captured. If nobody else in all of human history had never done what you did, right, that would come back to one haplotype. All the modern ones would have one haplotype. The wild population would have multiple haplotypes. You know, because you're 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 only taking one sample out of it, presumably, um, or maybe a few samples out of it, but they're, you're interbreeding them together. You're confusing that. So, now if you took one out five thousand years ago, and then in another part of the world somebody else did the same thing a thousand years later, and then both of those populations were around, scientists would trace back to two haplotypes, and so on. So what this means is that goats were domesticated five times. Um, it turns out from this from this uh, looking at these haplotypes that almost all modern goats, over ninety percent of all goats alive today, are descended from haplotype A. Um, over ninety percent are from uh, one of those domestication events. When did that take place? We can trace that back to ten thousand years ago. Um, the other one, uh, haplotype C, accounts for the rest of the domestic goats, almost all of the rest of the domestic goats. So that's, those are the two main ones. And then B has, has, a, has a significant portion too, but, but C is the big one. C domesticated 6,000 years ago, and uh, B was 2,100 years ago, whatever, 2,000 years ago. So, and then there's the other ones. There's, there's 
uh, D and E or D and F. Anyway, I'm not going to worry about it. And those were from small domestic, you know, isolated domestication events, and I don't know when those occurred. But the point is, is that almost all goats you see are descended from A, B, or C haplotypes, of which A is the dominant one. Um, but this is this is a great this is a great example here because I know for I I could almost I'd be willing to bet it anything that if I were to confront Mr. Hefner on this and say, hey, um, what about these dates? You know, you're you're making this claim that this supports Noah's flood, but what about ten thousand, six thousand, two thousand years? What about those? You know what they this? Well, that's all bad science. That part of your their study is all bad science. The the part you know that says five females. That's just like Noah's Ark. That's perfectly good science that that verifies the Bible. All those other stuff, you know, that that the carbon fourteen dating they did on the bones, the 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 uh, molecular dates they got, you know, to to go back to to match the archaeological evidence. All that stuff's just bad science because it's well, it it you know, ten thousand years is before the creation of the Earth, so therefore it has to be bad. If that makes sense. Well, if we think about the true history book of the world, the Bible, it says yes. there was a massive flood and Noah took two of many of the animals. But of the clean, he was to take seven pairs. Seven male goats, seven female, you. seven male rams, seven ewes, and so on. Then right after the flood, Noah made sacrifices of some of these clean animals. So if he had killed a couple of the goats and maybe about the same number of sheep, then we would expect that those that lived to propagate the goat population and the sheep population would be, you know, four or five, something this like that. This specific number. Isn't that so, marvelous? They could have refuted, actually, uh, you know, the scripture in a sense, if this had uh, not come out the way it did, if, if they had traced it to 20, one, 20 of them sure, or something or like 15. that. But this small number of DNA lines of the goat and sheep caused Smithsonian evolutionists to say this suggests that sheep and goats move together as they do today. Now, I like to what Dr. Oh. Jar Charles Jackson says. says, what do you know? Evo research even confirms the New Testament red-letter words of Jesus yes. who referred to separation of the sheep and the goats. Yes. You see? And we knew this all along. Once again, yes. it's a case of a Bible believer saying, well, we sort of already knew this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so for anybody out there who you know, Christians or otherwise who study the Bible looking for insight, meaning, and, uh, you know, guide guidelines to live your life by and such, uh, you can be assured, thanks to Mr. Hefner, uh, that Matthew 25 contains no such deeper meaning. So all of the famous sermons and essays written about it, you know, talking about that it's discussing uh, you know, the judgment of nations or whether it's discussing the value of faith versus works or um, all the other things that people have attributed to it, all of those are meaningless. Jesus was simply making a relatively mundane observation about the domestication time of sheep and goats. Simple as that. Now, of course, my briar patch is a population That's I love to right. talk about. Crunch it. the number. Well, this is really exciting. We uh, might have some common ground here. As it turns out, he likes population biology, and a well, a portion of my graduate research is in population biology. So, you know, this this can be really fun. We had some of this uh, not too long ago, but. Uh, which is correct, creation or evolution? Now, we have to go back only 4,500 years approximately to the time of the, the flood, flood of Noah's day uh, because we know there was a big death event if the Bible is an accurate history book, which we know it is. Yes. And so if you bring that forward at the rate of two and a half children per family, you will get the present world population, which is about six and a half billion yes, people to the night. under six, one half of a one percent yes. growth rate. On the other hand, uh, depends on which book you open up. They're all over the map on how long humans have been around. I've seen as long as 1.1 million. Let's cut that in half, as Raven and Johnson's biology book does, at 500,000 years. Cutting some slack for the evolutionary Well, and this is concept. their own claim, so yes. we're just going to test it. Yes. They must never have crunched their numbers, because if they had, they would get this number of people, 2.45, but we'd have to move the decimal 990 places to the right, oh which is more people than there are electrons that could be packed into the known universe. Professor, you so, have just blown evolution out of the courtroom well, and out of the courthouse. Certainly their scenario there does not work. And, uh
All right, before I get into what's wrong with the calculation that he was just discussing, I'm going to spend the rest of my time here doing a little real basic primer in exponential growth and population biology. If you're familiar with this, you can skip on to the next part. Um, but if you if you don't, I'll, I'll, I'll do a, hopefully just a really brief explanation. I'm not going to get into all the details. So this right here is called the, this is the exponential growth equation. Um, there, it's got a few other names. But essentially what this is, is this is how you would calculate a population if you have if you know the growth rate you know, the the instantaneous rate of change over time the you know the time you know the initial population size you can calculate what the population will be in the future um this is used sometimes when they're um actually its most important usage is when like bacterial cultures or when you stock fish into a lake where there's um you know unlimited food supply like a new a, a new lake uh, a new system because um, this doesn't take into account things like carrying capacity. It doesn't take into account, it assumes unlimited nutrients, unlimited food, unlimited space, this kinds of things. So um, it doesn't really apply to a lot of larger, more complex animal populations. It certainly is terrible for humans. Okay, this, would, this is an awful equation to apply to people. But I'm going to explain what they did. One, um, there's, there's, one of the things they do, okay, it's, again, this is population This is population at a time t, initial population, e, um, e, of course, you know, natural log, which is uh, 2.718281828459045. That's to 15 digits. It's a good one to memorize. It's kind of fun. Better than pi. Pi sucks. Um, rate is the instantaneous rate of population increase or decrease, and t is how much time has gone by. So... So hopefully that makes some sense. Um, so what they did is they, they actually solved for R by plugging in their numbers, assuming the arc was true. So just real quick and dirty here. So that would be, that's 6.5 times 10 to the 9 equals 8 times E times R times 4500. Okay. Um, so what they did, so what you do with that, you divide by 8, you get, what is that, 8, 1, 2, equals E, R to the 4, okay. Then you take the natural log of both sides, you get, what is that, 20 point, one, uh, was that, 5, 1, 5, 6, something, something, equals R times 4, 5, 0, oh, oh. Again, divide by 4,500, you get R equals 0 0.00455 something again. Um, so essentially, this is his one half of a percent. Okay, now where they screwed up in this, this is the mistake they made initially, is this is backtracking, this is calculating R, assuming a 4,500-year-old flood date, assuming there was a flood, assuming that eight people survived the flood, and then calculating R using a modern population size. Okay, th that's all fine and good. Um, there's nothing wrong with that itself. But you can't take this number. This number has no meaning outside of their assumptions. Okay, it doesn't have any... You can't take this number and then plug it into and, and say, well, let's just say the human population's a million years old or 500,000 years old. And you can't apply this number to it because this number doesn't mean anything. This number only means how many people would it take to get to the current population if a flood had wiped out all of humanity except for eight, 4,500 years ago. Okay, does that make sense? So we're talking about this is the worst case of, of circular reasoning. Uh, that's a common accusation they throw out. This, this is circular reasoning. Um, this is calculating a number based on your assumptions and then... you pretending that that number has some real value in human population growth. It doesn't, okay? Like most animals on the planet, like most things on the planet, R is actually pretty close to zero almost all of the time. Most populations are fairly stable. Human populations have been growing, and I'll talk about that later on. I'll talk about that. Um, but for the most part, most wild animals, most, most natural species, um, R is close to zero. R doesn't change. R can be negative or positive, but it, it, it tends to center around zero. Um, okay, I guess, I guess I'm just going to quit that. Hopefully that made some sense. I'll go on to the next part.